And there goes Pastor Phil. I didn't know if we were doing that. Uh, well, welcome, happy Labor Day weekend. Good to be with you all today. For the last handful of years, we've had a tradition that on this weekend, we talk about work. We talk about our labor. The hope is always to consider the space that we spend a lot of our time in, to broaden our definition of work, and to make some room for God to speak in the midst of the places and the things that we find ourselves putting our effort toward. It's also typically that this weekend and my birthday coincide. So it's not today, it was Thursday, uh, but I get to be up close and personal with the aspect of work because while I find my job life-giving the vast majority of the time, this particular week, because I'm one of those people who celebrates for the whole month, but also the week and the day, uh, I'd much rather be doing all of my favorite things with all of my favorite people because, I, again, I'm just that kind of birthday celebrator. But instead, I find myself spending the week alone in one of the various work spots in my house seeking the Lord for wisdom, which is also fun, but it's a different kind of fun than your birthday week. <laughs> At least I am spending my time in those spaces working diligently when I'm not urgently rearranging my linen closet or giving the dog a bath or washing the couch cover, all those things that for whatever reason felt like they had to be done this week. Tell me I'm not alone in this. Like when you have a deadline and a project that you have to do all of a sudden, thank you. All of a sudden there are things that you're like, wow, why have I been putting this off? It's so urgent to redo the, the couch cover. I actually had a friend, she's like, hey, how's the sermon coming? And I'm like, I'm about to head out and get a carpet shampooer. And she's like, whoa. Why don't you give it 20 minutes and see if you still think that's a good idea? Uh, I did not shampoo my carpets, but I just need another task so I can get that done. Uh, I tell you all this not only because I unabashedly love my birthday, but it's illustrative that so much of our lives is spent on work, on putting our effort towards things, be that vocationally focused or the work that sustains our lives. Cooking, cleaning, making the spaces that we inhabit comfortable for ourselves or others who come in. The work we do to care for others, kids, friends, parents. The work involved in throwing a birthday. For some of you in the room, your work right now is going to school. Good job, keep that up. We're working the vast majority of our days. Today, as we make some space to talk about work and think about what it is that God is saying to us in this season of our work, we'll be looking at the first three chapters of Genesis with this particular lens of work. And particularly in Genesis, we see three things. We see how God describes work. We see what our relationship to work is. And we see a little bit of how the curse of the ground and the painful toil of working plays out in our lives. So join me in prayer as we look at this. Lord God, we do ask that you would speak to us today. All of us have feelings about our work. Uh, even if they're ambivalent, Lord, we have uh, feelings about the ways that we spend a lot of our day. Lord, I pray that you would speak into those places, be they vocational, be they the things that you have put our hand to. Lord, we just ask for your word, we ask for your encouragement, and we ask for some clarity. In your name, amen. Before we look directly at Genesis, let's just take a beat and remember how complicated, layered, and even messy the very topic of work is. Each of us has these layers of cultural narratives about what hard work is and what that means. We also have family narratives that play in. I've said this before, but I come from a family that takes vacations in order to do house projects for ourselves or other people that we know. And for my family, work was always the most important thing. It trumped any other commitment or plan. And you couldn't even really be upset or sad or disappointed because it was work. And work is a huge deal. Often we refer to work as if it's this one thing. So we say, I'm going to work. Okay, what's that? What is that? Or we ask, what do you do for work? And when we ask that question, we're often referring to how one spends their day and in return gets paid. But as we've already begun talking about and thinking about, that's certainly not the limit of work. Ask any stay-at-home parent or caregiver if they worked today and you'll get an earful about how they spent their day. And some of it is probably pretty gross and things that you're glad you didn't have to do. And there are no forms of, of cash associated with that work and that job. 
What makes the topic of work even more fun to discuss is that work, again, whether paid or unpaid, sometimes involves toil. That place where it takes an enormous amount of effort and it's under stress in order to do things. And then sometimes as we work, produce or accomplish something, there's no toiling at all. In fact, it might even be fun or life-giving or even pleasurable. So we're holding all of these layers of what work has been, is in our lived experience, what we've been told it is, and the many ways that we use the word work as we come to Genesis. And we look at this first usage and description of work in the Bible. So Genesis 1, we have the creation story. Phil Phil read a little portion of it. God is making the foundation of the world with his words. He speaks the elements of the universe, the earth, and the way that they all interact with each other into being. There's this poetic aspect to the cadence. God said, God said, let there be light. God said, let there be a division between the sky and the waters. God said, God said, God said. It's important to note that we have no idea if God speaking things into being is easy or hard for God. We just know that he's doing it. I grew up thinking that creation was really easy for God, that he's just kind of walking around, shooting from the hip with swagger, like, you get an expanse of the sky. You get some living creatures in the water. You want a bird? Bingo, bingo, there's a bird. But it doesn't say that in the text. What does it do to our understanding of God, our understanding of work, if as God was creating, he was also metaphorically breaking a sweat or feeling like his heart was going to explode like ours does after a grueling workout because it's physically taxing for him or that he had to get up from his workstation and take a lap because he needed a break to figure out how to make the tides work so that the plants and animals that he thought he might make would be able to survive and grow in those waters. It's an interesting question to think about, and I do think our answer affects how we see God and how we see our own work. While we might not know the answer to that, how hard or easy it was for God to create the cosmos, we do know that when he's done, Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. When God looks at all the work that he's been doing, which has elements of both manual labor and intellectual labor, it wasn't just good, it was very good. It was exceedingly, abundantly excellent. It was actually the best. And this is still the case today. The work of God, his creation, of which, of which we are part, is still good and doing very good things. Theologically, this concept is referred to as common grace or common good. Grace and good can just be interchanged. The 35,000 foot level of this concept is that common good is, the, is one of the ways that the triune God through the Holy Spirit works generally through all people, so all humankind. So if God is everywhere, has no limitations, all present, all powerful, all knowing, then this is one of the many ways that he exercises himself in the world. So a short definition as applied to work, and remember this isn't just paid work, would be that in common good or common grace, every person who does good work is honoring and reflecting God. So there's a twofold application to this. The first is that work itself is good, it honors and reflects God. So a spreadsheet that's easily readable, a decor that puts people at ease, eye contact that makes someone feel seen, a bridge that you can get from one side to the other safely, a website that allows for purchasing while protecting people's information. The examples abound, they're unending. They can be said about all of our work, that no matter how good it feels in this season, the work itself is good. The second application of this common good, common grace is that the person or the people involved in that good work honor and reflect God. This also includes everyone. And it applies, it's kind of this pervasive enough that it applies to all humans for all time. Even if they aren't Christians, doesn't matter. You can actively denounce Christ, doesn't matter. It's one of the ways that the image of God is expressed is that good things reflect a good creator. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're universalists. Not at all, don't get worried about that. But it's one of the ways that a kind, loving, all-pursuant God communicates with humankind. 
So in Romans 2, verses 14 to 15, Paul says that God's law is written on the heart of every human being. So this common good, common grace means that with very few exceptions, most of them morally related, the work that we do is good and glorifying to God. Whether we have that thought or intention in the moment that we're doing the work or not, doesn't matter because it's built into the fabric of our being. This goodness, it's a gift of grace from God. So no matter what you do when it's done well, and sometimes well just means adequate, it gives glory and honor to God. So in Genesis 131, God describes work as good. Moving on, we look at Genesis 2. And as we look at Genesis 2 and talk about work, the fall still has not taken place. God is describing work as it was intended for us. And in these two sections, we see God giving us the picture that there's a rhythm to work. There's this time to work, time to rest. And that that work, whatever it might be, has a calling aspect to it. So all of us have been given things by God to work and take care of. So Genesis 2, 2 to 3. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God is modeling through creation that there's a rhythm to work and rest. This might be the hardest part of our work lives, when to stop working, whether or not that's like stop studying, stop cleaning the house, leave the office, whatever it might be. And if you're a parent of small child, of small children or a caregiver, you might be like, uh, that, I really can't do that. It might be possible that even the very idea of leaning into this like idea of work and rest, given your situation right now, might make you wanna laugh, like I can't do that, or cry, because you really wish you could. And yet God in his wisdom is inviting us to a life that has a rhythm of work and rest. God takes it for himself here that we see in creation and we constantly see Jesus doing the same. In Mark 1, 35 to 38, Jesus is at a village, he's been praying, he's been teaching, he's been healing and he goes up to pray and though people are looking for him to keep doing this prayer and teaching, that is his major job, right, in this this point of his ministry, he knows that his work in that village is done. It's time for him to rest from that village and he leaves. There's a lot of really great content in the world on the Sabbath. Uh, You can look on the internet. You can ask the people around you and their wisdom to share what they do, Sabbath, Sabbath practices. I think the thing that I would specifically want to highlight is that in these conversations on work and rest, we tend to create dichotomies. For example, we talk about work-life balance. And I don't think that this phrase or mentality is helping us. It creates a binary, a dichotomy, and we are not two-dimensional people. We're complex, we're layered, we're multi-hat wearing folks. This picture of a scale and the use of the word balance, work-life balance, implies that we're trying to get these two things even and that's impossible because our lives aren't static. There are always things being added to or removed from our work life and our home life. So the very idea that this can be balanced is already setting us up for failure. It's like, well, sure, they can be balanced while they zoom past each other, but there was that like microsecond, there, I did it. Further to call work-life balance implies that there's a work version of someone and a life version of them and that the two don't influence each other. That's also not true. If I'm trying to squeeze in one last conversation before the end of the day, which happened this Tuesday, and I walk into my house uh, and I have a dog who feels like that thunder is life-threatening, So I walk into the house and he has torn up the bathroom and peed everywhere. I assure you that for a short moment while I'm assessing the damage that has been done and where he's at, I'm not really paying attention on the phone call, though I was still on the phone call and saying a lot of uh uh-hahs and yas. So work, uh, life influences work sometimes. And equally, if someone unexpectedly pays for your coffee in the morning, you kind of walk into work with a little extra pep in your step, right? Like, that was great. And your workday starts a little bit better. So work and life are not separate. There is only one you. As John Medina talks about in his book, Brain Rules for Work, our bodies do not differentiate between the stress that comes from work or the stress that comes from home. Well, certainly not all stress is bad. It all affects our one and only brain and our one and only body. As a replacement of this concept of work-life balance, can we think of ourselves as multi-dimensional people with a need for health, for work, for play, and for love? 
trying to assess what our current needs are in these or similar categories in this season. And what does that look like in terms of how we're prioritizing our life? So second, regarding this dichotomy that we can create in the rhythm of work and rest, it's easy to think of it as a rhythm of work or rest, implying that I'm working or I'm resting, rather that both can happen in concert with each other. Definitely there's this like macro level of things that we see here in the scripture. God worked on creation, he said it was done, and then he took a rest. In Exodus, there's this call to let the land lay fallow on the seventh year, let it rest. In Leviticus, there's the year of Jubilee where after 50 years, everything takes a break. All debts are forgiven, there's this reset of all things. For us, we can emulate that a little bit in our work week and in our weekends. We get away from our vocational work or vacations or even extended vacations. That's kind of our macro level right now. But then there's also this micro level where, we invi- where we're invited to rest while we work. And rest is actually a part of how we work best. So during the work week, we still go to bed. Perhaps we make a meal and then sit down and enjoy it. The importance of this rhythm of rest is again, yes, for the sake of rest, but also for the sake of work. I I get to row as kind of a hobby, but then also as a coach. Uh, And whether you're on the water or you've been in a rowing machine at the gym, which you maybe you've seen this more more often, and Phil wanted me to clarify, I'm not in this picture. This is the Australian Olympic team. So I I didn't make it because of my citizenship alone, but... um, But whether you're on the water or in the rowing machine at the gym, there's this concept of run. So you use the phrase like, let it run, or can you feel the run? And this is referring to the enormous amount of energy you put in as you're pushing or pulling, which every single one of these women, you can tell, is putting an enormous amount of energy into the boat. And then you let it move. You let it run. You let the energy that you've put in expend. Again, you might see people at the gym who are just hauling on it, right? And the chain is slapping on the machine. And it's quite entertaining if you, if you need a break, enjoy it. Uh, but the, the point is that they're just kind of hacking away at it. They're sure it's technically moving. The flywheel is technically going. The boat will technically be moving, but you're also cutting off all of the energy that you just put into the boat, put into the wheel, by putting in more energy before that energy got to expend itself. So that first energy just was wasted. It just got canceled out. Not only are you getting very tired, unnecessarily so, but you're not not moving nearly as far or nearly as fast as if you let the boat run. The same could be said of swimming, which might be an easier illustration that you like work and take a stroke and then you glide. You work and then there's this micro rest. We rest while we work, not only as a gift, but because it helps make for better work. I'm reminded of Dr. Sarah Koenig, which I didn't know she would be here. I was hoping Labor Day she'd be gone. Uh, But contribution, she spoke at a conference here um, many years ago, and she was teaching on the Sabbath uh, that still kind of stuck with me all these years later. So as I recall it, you can... Correct me later if I was wrong. Um, What I heard her say uh, was that first and foremost, the Sabbath was given to us as a gift. It's not to wreck our productivity or to spend the day bored out of our mind or to heap shame on ourselves because we're not doing it right. But rather, it's this invitational opportunity to connect with God in a way that our typical week and our typical schedule might not allow for. So she suggested that perhaps one way to think about rest is to think about what we usually don't have, the time, the energy, the creativity, the space for during our typical week, and we can practice those things on the Sabbath. So if running is something you do on a typical week, maybe yoga could be a practice you do on the Sabbath. Or if reading and meditation is a practice you do during the week, then maybe painting or out loud prayer could be something. So if your week is filled with lots of doing, maybe the Sabbath for us is filled with being or vice versa. If your work is filled with lots of being, then maybe you do something. God models in his work that there's a rhythm of work and rest. And he also gives us a divine call. So as we continue in Genesis, we see Genesis 2.15. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
God calls Adam to work, serve, labor in the garden and take care of it. Some of us in the room might wish we had this kind of interaction with God where he was like, this is what you should do. Without, clear, without any question, be, do this vocationally or even do this in your free time. But every one of us does have a divine call from God. Most of us have several, but the most important one that we all share, this primary calling comes from God and comes from Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. First and foremost, we're called to Christ. And no matter how we spend our days, we're reflecting that calling in the things we do and the person we are. It wasn't really a mystery what Adam was going to do. Like, it, there was nothing else. Like, everything was the garden. It's the only place to live. It's the only place to work. It's the only place to get food, make a home, have dreams, be creative. There's only the garden. Obviously, there's more gigs in town for us than, for, than there were for Adam. But in some ways, one piece of the application is that if all work is good, again, with just very few exceptions, then whatever you find yourself to do, however you spend your days, is part of your specific calling, whether that be for a season or for a lifetime. So, so far in Genesis, we see about how God describes work, good, and how our relationship to work is rhythmed and it's called. Finally, in Genesis 3.17, we see the curse. So to Adam, he, God, said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. With the curse, there's this added component to work. Unlike what was intended, there is now a hardship and a frustration that comes with the things we put our efforts toward. At creation, there's nothing but abundance. And now all of our lived realities has had these places of toil, disruption, and even a filter of our identity or value that wasn't intended to exist. This disruption or toil can look a lot of different ways. Difficult bosses, toxic cultures, lack of work or underemployment, work being too big of a part of our lives, just straight up boredom at work, spinning our wheels and giving 100% and the results just not being there or not being what we thought would be given all the effort we were putting in. And there's lots of other examples. We've all experienced the curse of work at some point. Some of us are in seasons where work mostly feels like a curse. Each day being a grind or having to spend a lot of effort to just be remotely present. And if we're not in that season right now, some version of it will come soon enough. Even if it's just the length of one challenging meeting or one challenging client. But it also could be for a season. We all know what that's like. And yet, weirdly, work is not exclusively a curse. In Genesis 3.17, it seems like God is saying, like, from here on out, this is how it's going to be. All of work, provision, and livelihood is now going to be filled with hardship. And yet, that's not how it's turned out. Rather, there are times when we do our work and it's life-giving and invigorating. And others, when we turn around and do the same thing or maybe a very similar type of thing, and it's a huge drain. It's the thing we would like to be doing least. And maybe we don't even want to be like associated with it. Like, don't put my name on that. It's somebody else did it. But work itself is not a punishment for sin. After all, it's part of our calling, something that God did, and work as we know it is not entirely as God intended. There are times, sometimes very long seasons, when work is much harder, it's painful, and it can even feel meaningless. Like, what am I even doing? For those who are finding themselves in their place where work feels more like a curse than a divine calling, you have compassion from every single person in this room. We all know, at least in a glimpse, of what that's like. While sometimes there are external factors we don't have much control over that need to be managed or navigated, there are also things that we can control. A few questions to consider if you're in a role right now that feels more like a challenge than a life-giving is how much autonomy do I have right now and how much do I need? Said in a different way, how much control do you have in the things that you're doing right now? Sometimes this for sure is an, an issue of micromanaging that you don't feel like you have enough control. And sometimes it's the opposite, that you feel like you don't have enough direction or know how to succeed in this particular season. So you, so you feel stuck with paralysis. So to what extent is this a factor in the toil of your work right now? 
Second, do I feel connected with people and the mission? We're social beings, and we develop and sustain our engagement with our work through relationships with our coworkers, by seeing how what we do with our work fills a need, by having places to be empathetic with the needs of those we work for and with. So what level of connection are you feeling right now? Is that part of the pinch point? And finally, do I have the needed competency to do my job? You might be like, well, I do for sure. Maybe, but Bill Burnett and Dave Evans in their latest book called Designing Your New Work Life say that there are two common areas that we need to invest in growing our competency. Our areas of natural strength that are useful to our work and our areas of natural weakness that are required for our job. They go on to talk about how it's really easy to rely on our natural strengths as is. You can be like, well, that's in the strength category. I don't need to do anything about that. But to fully reap the benefits of our strengths, we also may need to grow them a little bit more. Equally, most of us encounter areas in our work that are required, but we aren't really good at, and thus competence needs to be grown. Do we have a big enough, robust enough ego, identity in Christ that we can go, yeah, growth area for me. I need to work on that. Work that feels more like toil than a gift is really not an easy place to be and there's often not a quick fix. Having been there myself in seasons and having sat with many people who have, being able to name those places that are pinch points allows us to try something different and maybe lead to a varied outcome than what we're experiencing right now, hopefully leading to enjoy work a little bit more. Genesis has a lot to say about work. Straight out of the gate, God wanted to, among many things, communicate how important our work is and how good it is and how it reflects him, what a gift it is, and that we get to be a part of it. If you are one of those people who are headed to work tomorrow, then you're probably an essential worker of some sort, and we thank you for the many ways that you are the backbone of our society If you have tomorrow off, I'd invite you to use the extra day to kind of consider what your rhythm of work and rest is these days and what God might be calling you into. Let me close us in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you're good. We thank you that you let us be a part of that goodness, even when we don't do so intentionally, that that's how good and thoughtful you are. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have the right size of voice of work in our, in our lives, that we would be clear what it is that you're calling us to give our efforts toward and clear what it is that you're calling us to rest from or to even walk away from entirely. Lord, please help this topic of work to not be more important than you, to not be more important to the relationship with you and show us again how to wear all of these hats uh, adequately in this season. In your name, amen.